Well, first I'll claim my bias, <laughs> which is I love startups. Um, and uh, I, the reason why I love startups particularly is because you build from scratch. That's really what I love to do. And I would say those, I like to call them intangibles, drive, passion, hunger, curiosity, these qualities that you do not teach, you either have them or you don't. Um, those qualities really help help new marketers flourish because those, those are the things you rely on to figure things out. And especially in a startup context. Welcome to the B2B Digitize podcast, where leaders of B2B technology startups and scale-ups learn how to use digital transformation to differentiate, educate, build trust, improve competitive positioning, close sales faster without compromise, and scale revenue growth. Now here's your host, Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run. Hi, I'm Joshua Feinberg from the B2B Digitized podcast, and I have with me today a very special guest, Rebecca Corliss, who is VP of Marketing at VergeSense. Rebecca, thanks so much for joining me today on the podcast. Uh, thanks for having me. It's great to see you again. I feel like we have to take every moment to see each other, even if it's in this digital form, to really appreciate the opportunity to reconnect. I know. It's probably only been... I want to say about a year and a half since the last inbound conference, but it feels like, you know, 18 years ago, not 18 months ago. Uh, it yeah, does. I, a, a totally different era. So that's terrific. I, I think the first place I'd like to start is I've known you probably the better part of 10 years or more dating back to the early days of HubSpot's marketing team. But can you give us a little bit of an introduction of how you ended up um, being a college student, how you stumbled across HubSpot, how you were involved in the early marketing team, early video, early live streaming, early building out of courses and user groups and evangelists. Can you give our viewers and our, our listeners a little bit of background? Yeah, sure. Happy to. Um, so first, my original background um, is PR. Uh, that's what I studied in college. Um, quite a bit of time ago, but it was a really great opportunity in terms of learning writing. And um, I met this incredible individual named Mike Volpe. Um, and uh, I was a new college grad. Um, I think what he saw in me was energy, ideas, and creativity, uh, a musical background, which I never thought would be relevant for the marketing world. Uh, and he gave me the opportunity to create HubSpot's first ever marketing music video. My goodness, this was in 2008 um, when YouTube was really starting to take off and marketers were thinking, ooh, we might be able to use creative videos for marketing. Imagine such a thing. Uh, and that was my big break. Um, and so I joined HubSpot when it was 50 people. Uh, the marketing team was a mere five and it was a cool opportunity really to, it was my opportunity to learn each facet of marketing. I kind of, my, the theme I say is when there was something brand new to be built, they put Rebecca on the job and I, I loved that. And that's how I learned that I'm truly a startup person. And uh, so that brought me to cool things like how we met with the HubSpot user group program um, and being having the opportunity to work with these amazing individuals and showcasing how HubSpot can affect the marketing world in these little micro communities across the United States and the world. Um, it brought me to the opportunity to build a program called Inbo Marketing University, which has since transformed over and over again to be HubSpot Academy, which is such, such a resource. Um, today with the amazing leaders leading it. And uh, it's been a cool place to really build my foundation and move forward. Yeah, it's really interesting. If you think about the same interests and background in music and the creativity and realizing how quickly marketing was going to be a place where not only education and trust building needed to be combined with entertainment to a certain degree, just to keep people's attention and engaging and stand out from the crowd and yeah, I remember that first video it was um you want to know from Alanis Morissette right yep that's yeah. exactly right um I'll tell I'll tell a, a quick anecdote um so imagine uh me and new gal at HubSpot and Mike he's uh very creative and he he always likes to dig it and wants to make sure the content's going to be really high quality and I love that about him and so when I was presenting the lyrics to the song this is all pre-recording um, we're sitting in a conference room with some of my colleagues and I, I printed it out, my goodness, which that even sounds archaic at this time, but I printed it out for everybody and I was going to read it. 
And Mike looks at me and goes, don't read it. This is a song. You have to sing it. And I think, oh my goodness, if you're going to put me in this situation, I'm going to sing the heck out of it. And I belted in that conference room. And then they thought, okay, this will be great. Yep, this works. <laughs> it was a fun moment. No, oh, it's, it's terrific. Um, so I think the first place that would be super helpful to get your thoughts on is for someone that is brand new to getting into marketing, digital marketing in a company that sells to other businesses, B2B, what advice would you give to someone if you think back to yourself, maybe going back 10 years or so, fresh out of school, or maybe somebody that uh, got connected with you through the BU alumni network, or maybe a friend of a friend, and they ask you for advice, what should they be thinking about to build their career up to be successful? and a, a marketing role in a startup that sells to other businesses? Yeah, um, I have two directions to answer that. First, for anyone considering B2B, um, one of the things that I, I think is really a shame when people think, oh, B2B is the boring marketing. Um, I like to say B2B is where the budgets are. Like that's the fun marketing. <laughs> is the reason why so many B2B products are called solutions. It's because they're actually to address real problems that business has have and are investing in. So I, I love, so I guess that's my first tip. Any, any new grad that's thinking, oh, I want to do the fun marketing. Like B2B is the fun marketing. It's fun to have businesses spend thousands, if not hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. That's exciting. So anyhow, that's thought number one. And thought number two, I mean, bringing on my own experience and, and thinking back when I entered uh, the marketing world, uh, I would say marketing yourself is your is your best asset when you're early in your career and you don't necessarily have uh, a foundation yet. Maybe you have a few internships, maybe you have a, a newer job, but marketing yourself and that can mean how do you create content and use use the digital world to showcase an idea that you have or or show the type of content that you can create or really successfully drive results. I remember I had the opportunity to hire a woman who said, I have this Instagram account and it has 350,000 followers. And that was the basis of the whole conversation. I said, tell me how, and it, it was so clear that she on her own had stumbled upon how to, the, the, what her audience would be, what the content would be to attract them, how she would cause the engagement in order to create this great resource. And I said, that's all marketing. You, you did it by yourself on your own. So I would say lean into lean into that idea and that will be great. Yeah, I remember in the early earlier years of HubSpot, there were stories of people creating music videos as part of the interview process, people running really creative LinkedIn campaigns targeting employees at HubSpot and Facebook ads targeting employees of HubSpot. And what better way to get your uh, hands in an active project that showcases your expertise than building your own blog, building your own podcast, YouTube channel, driving campaign results, account-based marketing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And also the drive, the drive that that individual has. And I would say when, you, when you're an ambitious company hiring uh, the best of the best, and that's your goal, you can't teach drive. You either have it or you don't. And so seeing those in instances in which someone does something you would never have thought of, um, that's going to catch someone's attention because that's that's a person who's going to enable him or herself to make things happen. And that's exactly the type of teammate you want on your team. Do you see those instincts be even more important in a startup -y kind of culture as opposed to walking in and being one of 50 people on a marketing team? Yeah, well, first I'll claim my bias, <laughs> which is I love startups. Um, and uh, I, the reason why I love startups particularly is because you build from scratch. That's really what I love to do. And I would say those, I like to call them intangibles, drive, passion, hunger, curiosity, these qualities that you do not teach, you either have them or you don't. Um, those qualities really help help new marketers flourish because those, those are the things you rely on to figure things out. And especially in a startup context, uh, you're doing things below your pay grade and way above your pay grade, way above your pay grade. Um, and you need to lean into those intangible skills in order to find the resources, the information to make sure you're making great informed, smart decisions. So it's very, very important to have those. Yeah, thanks for adding that because I think it's so important to contextualize for the kind of company that someone is working at, the size of team, how versatile they need to be versus how specialized. And it seems it makes an enormous difference depending on 
whether you're one of the first five people hired or one of the first hundred people hired in that particular role. I think that's true. Like, for example, when I think of even HubSpot's evolution um, in the first early days, uh, I think back to my now really close friend and someone I respect quite a bit, Ellie Merman and I, like we did everything. It didn't matter. We did everything purely because everything needed to be done. Um, when I left, the marketing team was approaching 200 individuals. It was amazing, amazing. And so now what was really celebrated and really needed was the specialization and this ability to optimize and unlock value in this uh, specific area so deeply. And that's a different skill set. That's a skill set that is incredibly valuable as well, that is really impactful in larger businesses where you need to always figure out how do you one up yourself, one up this channel, one up this strategy to continue to drive growth. That's some great advice for someone that's just at the beginning of their career. What insight would you offer to someone who's got at least a decades of experience in a marketing role focusing on B2B and maybe they've had a really difficult year, maybe the company they were working with was hit hard, especially by the pandemic. Maybe there's been a lot of turnover on their team, a lot of churn within the customer base. What would you advise someone in that role to help them reset and get back on track? Yeah, that's that's a wonderful question. And also my heart goes out to those in that, that position because there's been a whole lot of shakeup um, in, our, in our world in the past year. So my thought are a few things. One, um, I love the word consultative, being consultative. It really applies to the B2B marketing world. I think it applies to the interview process as well. I would say um, going into an interview, and this is actually the approach I took when I had the opportunity to interview for my company now, Verge Sense, is uh, use your interview process to pretend you're a consultant in the role and think about solving problems, like even within the interview process, if it's natural and natural to the conversation, of course. And the reason why I really like that idea is for two ways. One, for the individual interviewing, it gives someone the opportunity to imagine the types of problems he or she will be solving and confirm that they're interesting. Um, that's really important. And two, I think how that portrays the individual is uh, you start talking about the real work. And I think that often creates a hunger in the employer and saying, oh, I just, I can't wait to have this conversation on the other side of the, the hiring, the hiring contract. Wouldn't that be fantastic? So I would say dig in that way. Um, I have another tip. I'm going to tell you one of my pet peeves. It might make a few people angry because I think it works for some people, but it, I don't think it works as well in startups, growth stage startups, et cetera. It's when people are really excited to flaunt their playbook. I've got, it might be a hot button item, but a lot of folks will say, I have a playbook. I have a playbook that I do. And on the one hand, I'm sure they do. I bet they have a fantastic uh, set of strategies and tactics that they've applied here, here, and here, and it's worked great. And I, and I think that's excellent if you plan to continue to stay within the same space. However, if you're a startup person, being a figure it outer and knowing how to ask the questions in order to figure out what's right here, I think is more unique and super valuable because it shows how, how you tackle issues in ambiguity where there isn't a lot of information. So that's my, that's my takeaway there too. So somebody that's rolling up their sleeves and figuring out the personas and figuring out the jobs to be done and figuring out the whole journey as opposed to just coming in and assuming that because whatever they did in the previous role work that we should just do a find and replace and, and reuse that same playbook. Yeah, exactly. I can give a story. Um, so HubSpot, everyone knows HubSpot uh, in terms of being so strong in the content marketing world and thought leadership, like absolutely. When I joined, actually, this is a funny story in a different way. When I joined my last company, Owl Labs, um, I didn't want to rely on the way we, we did things at HubSpot. I wanted to discover on my own and use real data to make those decisions. And so uh, I actually uh, I actually dug into advertising and these different like paid channels quite a bit. Anyway, the long and the short of it, I at least got data to find out that content marketing was still going to be very effective <laughs> in this context. But it was wonderful to have that true data in order to validate the amount of investment we needed to do. So I, I think that's really important not to assume. Use your data to decide. And then just when you think you have it all figured out, the past 14 months comes along and changes so many people's playbooks and strategies on product services, target markets, yes. messaging. 
Yeah. Absolutely. And that's when I think those, those figure it out skills that dig in, what need, what do we do now? Um, maybe we're, we're dealing with uncharted territory here. Uh, being able to navigate that is so crucial, especially when things you don't expect come your way. When I was doing a little bit of research about Verge Sense, because I was curious, it really struck me that how the founder could have, obviously nobody had foresight to see this coming, but to be in a place where you could make such a big impact on offices, buildings, being able to safely reopen and keep a pulse for what's going on, it's got to have amazing opportunities around content marketing and webinars and worksheets and helping people figure all this stuff out. Yeah, absolutely. It's honestly, when I had the opportunity to consider the position, it was that very element that, and we know is a marketer's dream. And I said, oh, I had like, this is going to be fun. This is going to be fun to solve a problem that I think you could, it's fair to say is on the top five list of every leadership team across the world. <laughs> it's, it's really fascinating. Um, means, means that you really need to have a high bar in what you deliver, but it, it's a ton of opportunity. Um, for those, for the context, for those who might not know Verge Sense, so we're an enterprise hardware and software company that creates um, a, pro a workplace analytics platform to measure how, how people are using your office space. And also in terms of being agile, the original uh, real, real driver to purchase was to make sure you had the right amount of real estate to match your business. That's still true. That's still really important. But now it's all about, if you're a workplace strategist, you have no idea when people are going to come to your office on the other side of this, how they will use it, what they will need, and having data to validate is really important. So from a marketing standpoint, we have a real, really fun education opportunity in terms of offering our market and offering our buyers, um, leaning on the expertise of our teams to share, well, how do you, how do you progress in these uncharted times? How do you reopen your office? How do you do that safely, productively in a way that drives collaboration? It's super fun. We think about too, you mentioned something early on about college students having a perception that B2C marketing is much cooler than B2B. If you think about a commercial landlord or developer that has a 30, 40, 50 story high rise that's sitting pretty close to empty, there's an enormous, there's enormous financial implications to helping them get companies, tenants that are in a position to start filling up the space again safely. Huge, huge. And I think, I think when so another tip for those considering B2B, I don't know, versus B2C or, or B2B industry specifically, for me, um, and this is maybe why people like B2C often, um, for B2C, you can imagine marketing the products you'd buy yourself. Um, and I think sometimes that drives appeal because you have that empathy. I think when you can find empathy with your, you can find empathy with your buyer in a B2B context all the time. So with BirdSense, I thought, well, I'm, I'm someone who can't wait to go back to the office. Um, well, it'll be different, probably won't be five days a week, but I cannot wait to get that in-person time. And so even imagining that I could feel real empathy for the employees that our customers serve, uh, the impact of the decisions that our customers are making in order to think about how to reopen their space. And that empathy is then our motivator to think about how do we, how do we attract our buyer and, and, and really support them best. That brings us to the next question that I wanted to ask you is how that empathy, how that approach changes depending on where someone is in the research and purchase decision. We all know the stats that everyone throws around that just there's an enormous amount of shift from seller to buyer. Buyers are just mm -hmm. doing tons of research before they're willing to speak with someone from a sales team anymore for good reason. They're able to get access to tons of information. They're asking questions of Google and Siri and Alexa and posting questions on LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook all day long. How does your approach to B2B change depending on where you're trying to first intercept a prospect? Sure. Um, and I think it also, how much emphasis you put depends on the length of your sales cycle too, right? Um, so let's see. So one of the ways I think it changes um, and it's important, well, one, I think you need to map not only the needs at each stage, but also the mindset. That's where that empathy comes in. What is their mindset? 
um, and really being authentic to it. And that's how you can make sure the way that you speak to them aligns with what they care about in that moment. So, I mean, I'll take, I'll take a verge sense example. If we start <laughs> sharing uh, sensor and platform tech specs, when they're just figuring out what like reopening policies look like, that doesn't, that doesn't align. So that's really important. Um, once you've mapped out that mindset, I think you then can think about what is going to be of most value to them at that stage. And then I think um, going into that consultative solution based focus, you can really have the most impact because the best sales cycle, the best sales journey is one where you're in the mindset of I need to find people who have the problem that I solve. Um, because at the end of the day, you could be their hero. It's not even about making revenue. You could be their hero. You could be the answer of their problem that they're ready to invest in. And so how can you make sure you start the relationship by answering the questions they have then, make sure they have the right product information to know that it fits their needs, and then really dig in, in the sales process in order to con uh, get that nuanced view into what their true needs are and, and talk about how that's going to work. Where does it work? Where does it work? And how do you make sure it fits in order to then ultimately have a sale in which you have a customer that's really excited to get started and, and implement this new product? You know, you bring up so many really interesting, subtle nuances that so many people seem to often overlook. If I think about the brand buzz and perception that people had of HubSpot 10, 12 years ago is basically you taught hundreds of thousands and millions of people about SEO, about digital marketing, about how to set up their Twitter profile the right way, about what, uh, how, to, how to do LinkedIn right. So much to the point that they many times learn these great things, had a great perception of HubSpot before they even knew like, so what does HubSpot do? And <laughs> being able to connect the dots, like awareness, consideration, decision, staying with them through that, that whole process is a big part of it. But I, I think just the same as I always tell people, your goal really is to get them to fall in love with your content and then by extension, fall in love with your brand. And then it's a much easier process of them seeing you as the educator as the trusted advisor helping to shape the criteria that they use to evaluate the whole process. And when you do that right, not only are you on the short list, if you do it correctly, many times in a B2B context, you are the entire short list. Whether they, yeah. whether the prospect actually tells your sales team, that's another story, but it's a great way to differentiate and neutralize competition. Yeah, right on. And I would say uh, we saw the sales journey beginning um, at that point when someone, I mean, remember this is 2008, uh, Googling, what is blogging? <laughs> like that's where the sales process began. And like our top of the funnel, um, like the timeline in which we focus on top of the funnel was maybe 50% of the full journey. Because once you came in, our, 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 our sales cycle in terms of talking to sales and closing could be a matter of months. So really the time that we needed to focus on was that beginning journey. Um, and it could be even it could be even longer than you might expect. Um, those individuals who, I mean, we'll, we'll put it real into context. Um, when building Inbound Marketing University, it was 2009. What was happening in 2009, this terrible recession. And so real, real long, long play. Um, I was honored in terms of building the certification program. People use that to better themselves in their career, get the new job which is wonderful. What we all wanted to do was get back to work. And then they advocated for purchasing HubSpot. And so, I mean, that's even the longer journey and it really goes down to earning credibility. And I would say earning trust. It's an interesting um, place that HubSpot ended up in in the last couple of years too, was spending a lot, putting a lot more emphasis on getting college professors to use HubSpot in the classroom, which I can relate to. My job during college was working for IBM. And Apple did the same thing and Microsoft did the same thing where they went on campuses and they were trying to get professors to adopt the platform because they knew if you were a Windows user all through college or Mac user all through college, there was a very good chance the first time you had a chance to pick your preferred platform. If you're using HubSpot in the classroom as opposed to another uh, MarTech stack or something like that, it's, it's the same idea as the comfort, the familiarity tends to breed loyalty. Yeah, and even today, I mean, I so I'm in the position where I'm I'm hiring for a handful of roles myself and my team at Verge Sense, and I smile from ear to ear when I look at someone's LinkedIn and I see HubSpot certified, Inbound Marketing certified, and I think it just makes me so happy because one, I'm glad 
I'm glad for just the HubSpot brand continuing to flourish. That's wonderful. And two, I love, I love seeing the full impact. Like that is as good as marketing can get. Full marketing that impacts the full ecosystem and the full marketer and truly with the goal of bettering their world, their lives, and then seeing the, the opportunity that comes from that. I've often said that in a lot of ways, the free education that a SaaS company like HubSpot has put out should make the marketing professors at a lot of universities very nervous that they need to keep raising the bar to make sure to be able to justify the tuition investment and the time investment of a formal higher education approach to teaching these same courses because um, everyone's constantly comparing these different options. It could be, or the evolution that can come from it. Is this a, a rising tide raises all boats moment where uh, university systems also think about what can they uniquely provide that maybe they weren't prioritizing before? I mean, that's that's the best of every world. The experience. Experience is uh, mm -hmm. the real world experience of encouraging somebody to build their first uh, blog, build their content offers, doing customer insight research, giving all these super hands-on things. So when they walk in for their first interview, someone's like, Wow, you know, we have people that have been here three, four years that haven't gotten to some of these, yeah. some of these things yet. Real live demo portfolio. Yeah. What when you look big picture at what some other companies do with approaching B two B marketing, B two B sales enablement, what do you think is the biggest mistake that a lot of companies make that's preventable if they knew better going into it? One thing that comes to mind, and this is especially true right now where we're um, a full enterprise sales process, um, uh, long, long journey given, given the, the investment of our platform. Um, I've been thinking a lot about attribution and uh, one of the, I think, uh, problems that some folks could, could adopt accidentally is putting a lot, I would say too much value into lead source. Um, I actually used to think this way all the time at HubSpot, love lead source. Where did it come from? It came from social, came from organic search, came from email, came from a BDR, great. And I think, well, I think it's really important to capture that. There are some businesses who put 99% of their like, marketing ROI evaluation into just the entrance point, where I think in some cases it might even be irrelevant. I mean, that's what I believe. And I think I think businesses, especially if you have a lengthy sales cycle like ours, who really invest in understanding all the touch points that a prospect has along the journey um, to becoming a customer, I think that's more impactful because ultimately you're doing this, not this territorial mechanism to give credit and celebrate and win. I mean, sure that happens, but that's not the value to the business. The value to the business is understanding where to invest more. And so I think companies who aren't investing more into just that full attribution picture are really losing the opportunity to understand um, where they should put more dollars or where they should take dollars out in order to keep growing. Yeah, it's, it's interesting too, to see all the different models that people are using to try to justify that they've completely figured it out. But it's so easy to see at the same time, the things that sometimes get attributed to organic search or paid search or really a brand search on the company that started with something much more impactful happening that wasn't as easy to measure. Yeah, yeah. Or a uh, new lead comes through a partner. That's awesome. But it's actually because they read a press release and then they asked the partner or, or vice versa. We get a new lead from a webinar, but it's actually because, I don't know, a BDR <laughs> did a quick phone call and they went and jumped to the website. So I think, I think we need to really lean in, especially as digital marketing gets more and more um, sophisticated of seeing how these things weave together and just accepting that there isn't this binary, which cup can I put this customer win into? Like it doesn't work that way. And embracing that, letting go and saying, all right, I know that these, these experiences weave together. I want to measure the whole ecosystem ultimately because it's not about credit. It's about knowing where to invest. Do you think the pressures of so many companies in the space following these playbooks having venture backing adds to complications because there's an impatience to show that something is working or in being able to measure things in the short term that sometimes are really difficult to measure in the short term, especially when I think about like a startup that's trying to get to product market fit or go to market fit and there just being so many unknowns. Interesting. Um, I think when things aren't going well, or you have a big goal in front of you, there's a lot of pressure. And I think when there's a lot of pressure, there's often an instinct to go to the 
nearest answer versus, or the most obvious answer versus the best answer, most impactful answer. So I think that in that dynamic, that absolutely could be the case. Um, I also think that then, I mean, it's real marketers leadership opportunity to say, I understand why there's interest in being really binary about just like categorizing a customer by a source. But what ultimately what I want to do, like you go back to the value you're trying to provide. Ultimately, I want to be able to have conviction in where I want to invest. And the method in order to have that clear answer is this. And so this is what's going to serve us more than that. And I think when a marketer can step back and speak to the ecosystem in that way, in those high pressure situations, that's going to be much more successful and a real moment for credibility for him or her. And there's the extra complication too of post-purchase. What does the retention look like? What is the, is it someone that's a really good fit that's getting value enough out of their investment that they're going to stay and become a, a customer marketer's dream, being a great evangelist and promoter? Or are they at the other extreme where sales pushed really hard just to get it over the finish line and maybe it wasn't the right fit? Yeah, yeah. And I think that just emphasizes that measurement doesn't end <laughs> at the purchase. Continue collecting that data. The data you collect might evolve, but continue to collect that data because that's going to be really impactful, especially if you're at a startup phase or a scale phase in which more data is going to inform what you do and how you prioritize. That's terrific. The final area I wanted to ask you about today was to get your thoughts on where B2B digital marketing, where B2B sales enablement, where the whole B2B playbook is headed in the next 12, 24 months or so. Is there something that you see going on right now that seems like it's going to be this big inflection point where we'll look back and be like, oh yeah, that was the big thing that was changing everything. Sure. Um, so where my mind goes, it really is relevant to the time right now is what marketing channel have we all lost that might have an opportunity to be reborn? And that's events, um, physical events, in-person events. And I know for our market, particularly events are great. I know in the meantime, we've, we've done the digital events and that's been wonderful from uh, a demand gen standpoint as a means for our reps to talk to their customers, et cetera. But it's, you, you, we've lost the depth. We've lost the depth in that. We've gained accessibility. That's interesting. We've gained <laughs> accessibility to it. We can now join without traveling. So that's a win, but we've lost the depth. So I think, I hope that those who produce events from a marketing standpoint or those who use uh, events as a marketing channel use this really disruptive moment to think about how can we take the winnings from this disruption and what we miss and actually create a new, totally fantastic marketing channel event type that can impact businesses. So that's where I put my bets and a lot of changing, a lot of changes happening very soon. Hybrid events and offline events and getting back into traditional conferences and trade shows. Or maybe something totally, totally different that neither you and I are thinking of right now. I don't know. Yeah, it'd be really interesting to watch that space continue to evolve because anyone that had large investments in that has had to get really, really creative the last 12 or 18 months with running virtual events and to try to keep. But then I, what's interesting too, is I see in the next few months that a lot of traditional IT events that I've gone to over the years are coming back in very reduced capacity with all kinds of safety measures and as hybrid events, I guess, with the idea that yeah. they're keeping everything warm with the idea as we move into next year that they'll um, look to return to where they were in years past. Yeah. Well, I'm an optimist. Joshua, I have to be. I'm an optimist. So I, I can't wait to see what creativity is born um, from this because I do think these these moments to come together are so impactful, so impactful. And uh, I I know they will flourish and I expect it will be in a new, a new evolving form. Every inflection point in the last 20 years or so between the housing bubble, between post 9-11 brought so much innovation in technology and rethinking how companies communicated in workplaces and it's hard if one talks about the idea that we've had a decade of digital transformation in a matter of months be really really interesting to see how that plays out with all these new experiences so true so true well thank you so much for joining me for this podcast interview it's been super helpful really really insightful and i know a lot of the 
viewers and listeners that are going to watch and listen to this will get a lot of value from hearing about your experience in building and deploying B2B digital marketing and startups and scale ups in all different contexts. Um, I know you're active on LinkedIn. Is that the best place for someone to reach out to you if they have any questions or want to connect with you? Yeah, that would be great. Rebecca Corliss on LinkedIn. Love to connect there. That's where I have some of my most fun conversations. Um, so please, please find me. It'd be great to connect. Absolutely. And I'll make sure I include a link to that with the show notes too. Thanks again so much for joining me, Rebecca. It's been great. Wish you all the best in growing your career. And I look forward to continuing to see great things coming from Rebecca Gorlis. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. Thanks for listening to this episode of the B2B Digitized Podcast. To subscribe and leave a review, check us out at b2bdigitize.com or wherever you like to consume podcast episodes, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and YouTube.